I warn you, this is an expert audience. <laughs> we have industry here. We have non-proliferation experts here. Um, we may even have some regional experts here. I'm going to start off with um, a couple questions. But my big one is, and we'll start out, we have to compete with next door, costs. Chris, you, you brought up this topic. Um, and our, I think our slides will be, are your slides releasable to our website? Uh, yes. Okay, so all of the slides that you saw today will be up on our website. Uh, if you have trouble accessing them, just email us and then we'll send you PDF copies. But I, I thought your slide was fascinating. You know, when you take out the U.S., if you want to think of the U.S. as outliers, the costs are still rising. When we were in India, one of the <clears throat> comments that uh, the WNA person made was, gee, wouldn't it be terrific to have the Chinese and Indians in there as suppliers, because it'll bring the cost down. <laughs> so um, do you think, now sort of the Chinese and the Indians are, uh, definitely the Indians are hypothetical at this point, but South Korea, do you think South Korea as a new supplier um, is going to contribute to bringing the cost down for nuclear, uh, for new nuclear build, or is this kind of the, the loss leader that they have? And if you could talk about the different kinds of costs, because obviously, um, you know, suppliers who are so strongly um, supported by their governments have, have a lot of different ways, a lot of different sweeteners that they can uh, bring down some of the costs for, for new recipients? <laughs> uh, I thought you were going to ask me an easy question to start. <laughs> I'm sorry. Answer whatever <laughs> question you want to <laughs> answer. <laughs> uh, my boss has been bugging me to get a really good close answer on nuclear costs. And the problem is, is that there's a tremendous lack of transparency, uh, especially for in, 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 the, in the Chinese uh, um, manufacturers. So, that you know, what is it really? What are they concluding in the costs? Uh, um, in Korea, the the bid that they won was significantly less. Uh, the, what they the, they bid was significantly less than the French. You know, on an order of sixteen to twenty million dollars less, uh, sixteen to twenty billion dollars less. So many people believe that there have there's no margin in this first investment for them. But from strategic long-term um, uh, positioning strategy, and the Koreans are very, very good at that, they desperately needed to expand their nuclear capabilities beyond um, um, Korea. And this was a, an excellent opportunity for them to go ahead and do that. And I was there uh, uh, just you know, a few weeks ago, and they had, um, it was a whole showcase for Korean technology and, and, and what's going on. So the costs, it, it, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. There's confusion, what's included, uh, the vendor, the overnight, the all-in, uh, uh, owner's costs, and so there, there's, there's confusion in that. The presence of global competition is going to make a difference, but I see prices rising uh, uh, steadily, and um, uh, it's, it's a very, very expensive technology, so expensive that a lot of company, uh, countries are sort of giving pause to pursuing um, their investment. And a perfect example of that would be Poland, which has a desperate problem in that 90% of their generation comes from coal. They desperately need an alternative, but they're, they're, they're scared to make an investment in nuclear power because they don't have a history, that, even though they have a very long uh, and, and well-established research group, they don't have experience constructing. And they're very scared of, of, of the prospect of having uh, another uh, European nuclear uh, economic disaster uh, like exists at Flamanville and at Okiluto. So, um. well, one of the, the one of the bigger components of cost is the financing, right? So, one of the strategies for lowering costs is to build them more quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and the Koreans have been quite good. At that, the Chinese, I think, are also good. Do you lose something when you're trying to build things so quickly? I think Alan made a very, very good point that you never know really the cost until all the job is, is completely done. Like you can't evaluate a real estate transaction until you sell it. So when the project's all finished and done, then we'll get a good uh, sample. 
you know, we spend a lot of time modeling uh, the time value of money, and if you have a 10-year construction cycle as opposed to a five-year construction cycle, what does that do? And so all else being equal, what is the, the impact of that going to be? In a current interest rate environment where interest rates are low, you know, it's less of a significant difference. But if you're in a high interest rate, which you know, could happen in a few years, it could be disastrous for some of these, these projects. Another very important um, characteristic of building uh, nuclear power plants globally, I think, is, and this is, I think, played a very big factor in the, the Korean victory in, uh, in the Emirates, that it's not so much the technology that matters, although it matters to a great extent, but the ability of the engineering procurement contractor to go ahead and get the job done. So um, the Europeans were struggling with two projects in Europe. The Koreans, through Samsung and Hyundai, have demonstrated their ability to build pro projects on budget, on schedule, in the region. And when you go to, to the, the Bacharach uh, installation, you have a sense that it's exactly what's happening, that the, the, it's almost military-like uh, um, and, and it works. They're, they're, they're getting it done. But again, it's still very early in the game. Mm -hmm. Uh, the South Koreans, I'm sorry, and then I'll uh, just want to follow this just a little bit more. The South Koreans have a lot of big construction experience, particularly in energy projects in the Middle East. Um, I'm not quite so, I don't know as much about the Chinese, but I would think that building <clears throat> reactors in China and India is a whole uh, a lot different than it might be building other places. Do you think the Chinese and Indians might have trouble sort of translating that capability overseas? It's a separate question from capacity, because I think right. I would like to talk about capacity issues later. <laughs> One of the questions mm -hmm. I wanted to find out, and I specifically added, uh, asked the um, head of the, the construction project, how many Koreans were on site? Uh, in Bacharach, and there are 1,200, or there will be 1,200. So 1,200, they said their total workforce was 10,000. So the ability of Koreans to mobilize 1,200 people to come from Korea with experience working on the reference plants in Korea, and then now to duplicate that experience or leverage that experience to build more effectively in, uh, in the Emirates was a very, very significant um, strategy that is being implemented by the Koreans. Whether or not the Chinese can accomplish the same, um, it remains to be seen. Um, and that's one of the issues that we're looking at in Europe, where uh, the, the interest in the UK government to revitalize their nuclear power industry means that they're going to develop their own supply chain, they're going to put their own engineers to work. So in essence, one can argue that you're having your third first-of-a-kind plant in, in Europe. And so how much learning experience is going to follow the, the third construction of an EPR in, in Europe remains to be seen. In China and in the US, there's been a tremendous amount of, of, of movement of US um, um, construction people to China to observe what's going on. So the projects that are being built in the US are taking advantage of lessons learned uh, in China. Um, apparently, they, they say the same thing will happen for the EPR project, but when you look at the estimates for that project, one has to question whether or not that's really happening. Okay. Questions from the audience? Do we, have, we do have microphones. So, Corey up front, and, and just identify yourself. Uh, so, following up on, oh, sorry, Corey Hinderstein from the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Um, following up on this discussion of costs, and it comes back to something that was in Alan's presentation about the kind of um, dominance of the Russians in winning the most recent rounds of contracts. Um, in thinking about the responsible nuclear suppliers, what we've heard from others is that there are concerns about Russian supply when it comes to, again, not the credibility of the fundamental technology, but QA, QC, um, culture issues, the rest, and yet they still are winning the contracts, which to me seems like it's based, that in the end it's based primarily on cost. So my first question is, is that true? I mean, is cost really what's winning out over these other concerns? And the other related question then would be, are there ways to describe costs that aren't direct financial costs to doing business with partners who may not be responsible nuclear suppliers. So that 
and then I don't want to single out Russia there, but that so that happens to be with the reactor units in that case, but to Gretchen's point, it also um, would seem to be a consideration when you're establishing your relationships down the, up and down the supply chain. Alan, do you want um, to? I, I think the best answer I can give to the question is that there is price and there is cost, and sometimes there's a relation and sometimes there is not. And so what you are seeing is, uh, is a price, uh, a nominal price that's out there and from the perspective of the buyer, that's what the buyer sees, and the buyer is making decisions on low cost to them, which means lowest price. How that correlates with the actual cost of executing the pro project can be all over the place, as, as we know. And uh, you know, we were talking earlier about transparency. There is no transparency uh, out there with regard to uh, the, a lot of the contractual terms, and certainly not into the cost that the vendor sees. In, in Finland and Flamanville, uh, you know, you, you, know, you got public companies, you can see the, the cost impacts uh, of those projects. We don't see the cost impacts uh, of, of what's happening in Russia and the Russian built reactors. I don't think we've got a clear uh, picture uh, in, uh, in uh, China or India as well. And so it's very hard to tell um, whether or not the vendors are actually making money or whether they are losing money either on purpose or, or by accident. But if you're, uh, if you're a country that's got limited resources, your focus is on, on price that, the, 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 that you see, and then you try to get the kind of terms that will make sure that the, the vendor honors that price. And if the Russians can continue to offer uh, prices that are very competitive, bring along the financing, and an additional thing which I didn't mention, uh, potentially offer to take back the used fuel, they have a competitive advantage that nobody uh, else can touch. Okay, uh, DJ and then Melissa. Thank you, VJ Saswal with uh, USAC. Uh, my first question is very similar to what the uh, uh, earlier uh, questioner asked, which was that uh, you mentioned the elephant in the room, uh, uh, Alan, and I thought it was not Rosa Tom, it was really the financing. Uh, I, I think that is becoming a very crucial issue, and, and all the reasons that you have given, uh, much more. It's the local politics of these countries is driving uh, people, uh, honestly, uh, the bus bar price is absolutely not acceptable in most countries. And I will today give a, a, a less than 50-50 chance that even Czech Republic will go nuclear at the end of the day, besides, of course, Poland. Uh, uh, and this is, this, this is being solved by the Russians through, uh, through a, uh, essentially putting up a, a, a sovereign fund, which is essentially funding most of these uh, activities. And uh, on the other side, we have uh, UK, which is coming up with real uh, loan guarantees and other uh, uh, subsidies for the uh, consumer. So we, we really have to think in terms of the developed world, where we will, at the end, have to rely on governmental assistance of one kind or the other. And on the other side, uh, in, the, in the foreign emerging markets, uh, financing will be the key factor for us to make any sales. Uh, uh, any other comments, I would appreciate it. But let me also go one question to, to Gretchen. Gretchen, I, I noticed uh, you didn't mention anything about IAEA's uh, program, which is also fairly uh, wide and comprehensive in terms of getting new countries shaped up. Uh, are we still trying to kind of look at it as a bilateral type of arrangement, or do you think multilateralism has uh, some space here for them to work on? Thank you. Um, the reason I didn't mention the IEA is that I was really focused on um, industry-led programs. <clears throat> so er, all the examples I used were industry-led programs, and there are obviously lots of great things that are going on that are coming out of governments or the IEA, and um, by no means did I mean to, it was just that I was focused on industry's role. So there was no in, in, ill intent of, uh, of, of not looking at them. In fact, I have staff that spend a lot of time looking at nuclear newcomers and working through the IAEA and um, fabulous programs that are going on. Before we go to Melissa's question, you know, we haven't talked about small modular reactors. <laughs> and 
I'm almost getting the sense, because this is, you know, in some circles, this is the thing that's going to save the U.S. nuclear industry. Um, and some of these recipients actually would be better off with small reactors because of the size of their electricity grids. But the sense I'm getting from our conversation today is if the, the big guys, you know, the Russians, um, are going to do all this financing and take back spent fuel, that, you know, why would any other country be, why, why would a new or country that wants nuclear power be interested in anything else? You guys have any responses? <laughs> um, I must admit that uh, Alan took me out late last night, several Grand Marniers, uh, and we discussed this, this uh, topic at great length. So, uh, <laughs> and I missed it. How did I miss I'm that? very well prepped for this. Uh, <laughs> so uh, even though my head is a... <laughs> um, you know, small modular reactors uh, um, seem to be a great solution for certain applications. Uh, and there's two of them that I can think of, uh, or th perhaps three of them that I can think of right away. Um, but there's a lot of controversy surrounding them, and um, for all intents and purposes, um, you know, um, we can still describe them as being you know, paper or PowerPoint reactors until we have one in the ground operating and generating electricity. Jordan uh, has uh, signed a contract with um, uh, Rosatom to build a you know, thousand megawatt reactor or thereabouts. Uh, and to supply electricity to a grid that's only 2.6 gigawatts. So that, I think, defies all sorts of engineering logic to put a 1,000 megawatt reactor onto a 2.6 gigawatt uh, grid. Secondly, um, uh, Jordan is one of the driest countries in the world. Nuclear is one of the thirstiest technologies in the world. So to put a nuclear reactor, which is very thirsty, in one of the driest countries in the world, does not make any sense. Um, Jordan has a tremendous solar resource. Um, they are cash constrained. To me, that makes sense that they do one of two things. They try to deploy uh, solar technology in an incremental basis, wait until an air-cooled um, a Babcock and Wilcox uh, small modular reactor that's being supported by DOE is, is introduced in 2025 uh, time frame. That seems to be a plausible, good solution for them instead of going and, and spending a lot of money on a big reactor. A lot of skepticism in the industry, I think, about the, the, the wisdom of going ahead and, and investing in, uh, in, in a large reactor for Jordan. The uh, uh, Under Secretary of Energy uh, from the Sudan looking to shop and buy a nuclear reactor for Sudan. And uh, he very quickly focused on the interest in small modular reactors as being something that makes more sense for, for them. In Poland, there's a huge controversy right now whether or not to invest in large reactors because they don't have experience doing that, or to go ahead and, and develop smaller reactors, which enable them to go ahead and displace existing very dirty coal facilities to site the nuclear reactors in proximity to the load and, um, and uh, and to also reduce the investment risk that they face by you know, spending, I think their estimate is 18.9 billion for three gigawatts of reactor. So that's pretty, it's pretty close to the, the, it's not as high as the Hinkley investment, but it's pretty high on the range. So they're scared of the financial uh, commitment they have to make. They need smaller reactors uh, deployed closer to the, uh, to the load so they don't have to go ahead and invest in transmission facilities. So there are certain applications for them and I think the industry uh, uh, and, the, and the, the, the need is there, and they would have sales if the technology was deployable imminently. Sure, and let, let, let me add, uh, uh, well, first of all, I'm not sure who took who, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, yeah, I, I happen to be an SMR skeptic, uh, uh, and I'm skeptical because there's a reason that reactors grew to be as big as they are, and that was to gain the economies of scale associated with a high upfront capital cost uh, technology. It's true that there's another way to get economies of scale, and that's volume production, which uh, presumably would be one of the driving forces uh, to making SMRs uh, uh, economical. But in order to do that, you have to make a lot of them. And if we end up with five or six companies uh, that are effectively offering uh, SMRs and each company only has an order for three or four of them, you'll never get the economies of scale. Uh, they were, uh, the approach, there's a reason that they were started in the United States conceptually. 
One is because we've lost the capability to make the big reactors in the United States, so there was a desire to go down a path that would allow us to, uh, to, to build them. We can still make small things because we still make submarine reactors, for example. Uh, the second thing is financing, and the problem that we have in the United States is that we have a very balkanized utility system with a large number of relatively small utilities. Even the biggest one does not have a balance sheet that can take uh, a, a huge uh, lump like uh, 10 to 20 billion dollars and put it on the balance sheet. It's, it's almost impossible. It's completely impossible in the merchant market. And so there is a driving force in finance, and there's one in fabrication capability that says small reactors in the United States. The problem is that unless you can produce kilowatt hours coming out of those SMRs at a competitive price compared to the big nuclear plants and everything else, then it doesn't have a place in the market, and that remains to be seen. So that's why I'm skeptical. Mm -hmm. One last thing that I would add is uh, that, uh, once again, uh, the, the Russians are the elephant in the room. They've just finished the construction of their first small modular reactor, which happens to be on a barge. Uh, which is modeled after their, uh, their ice breakers and their, their submarine fleet. And so uh, <coughs> they're, they're the first uh, to be out on the market with, uh, with a demonstrable small modular reactor. Yay. Melissa. I'm Melissa Mann with Urenco. I wanted to ping off something Corey said, um, and that was, does cost always win out? And I can tell you that in my marketing experience, I've never been given credit for being a good non-proliferation player. Uh, it really does come down to cost a lot, uh, which uh, raised a question for Gretchen, really. And a lot of the incentives you talked about uh, were for the suppliers. H have you looked at all about the benefits of having incentives for the buyer to buy from those that really do have the, the good housekeeping seal of approval? Because my sense is what you want is for all suppliers to come up to that level. It's a great question. Um, I, the one thing I should make a point is we've been talking about suppliers, and I just want to broaden out that when I've been using this term often, I'm also talking about that whole supply chain with respect to the dual use folks as well. Um, and often, as I think you've heard me say, Melissa, um, you know, reactors don't fall off the backs of trucks, and so you know they typically don't get diverted. And what does get diverted are more of these other smaller things that are all going into whether it's designed as centrifuge or whatever. So that's just a comment that i just making sure definitionally that I get that out there. Um, but as far as looking at it from the buyer's perspective, it is an interest. I haven't thought of it turning, turning the, uh, you know, the cart that direction or looking at it that way and be happy to you know, brainstorm and try to think of what you know, went on this list or completely different list would make sense to try and um, help them see the importance of trying to you know, source from these folks that really are doing above and beyond what they should be doing. Um, you know, you'd think at the end of the day, even their reputation matters, right? So if you're, a, if you're the buyer and you're being seen as sourcing from really good places, you know, that's gonna make you look better as the buyer. So you think you, in a sense, would increase your reputation, not just the reputation of the suppliers, but you as the buyer as well. So that would be my hope and just my gut feel that that would make sense. But anyway, happy to brainstorm with you. In the back here. Paul Murphy, Milbank. Um, just on the point of reputational risk, I would add, in terms of considering angles to the discussion to look at lending policies, because w whether it's export credit agencies or commercial banks, reputational risk issues are a huge factor. You can sort of separate out the financing discussion into sort of the, the classic, will I get paid back? How will I get paid back? And then equally important that we're seeing in the deals that we're financing right now on nuclear projects is the reputational risk analysis. Is this a good project um, in terms of looking at the country, in terms of looking at the capability of the host country regulator? Um, and putting all these together to meet you know, the lending requirements that the banks have as well as sort of sustainability issues in terms of the overall project that are not unique to nuclear but are part of these lending policies that the banks have. And so, you know, even if you don't want to rely on the benevolence of the market in terms of the suppliers and the customers, <clears throat> if they have to finance it on the market, they're going to have to deal with these issues. If I can respond to that one, Sharon. Um, 
you and I need to talk. I could not agree with you more. We've just started this really interesting piece in looking at kind of the finance trade and who all the players are. And talk about making your head hurt. Given you do this for a living, you probably know this, this picture that's been shown to me, of letters of credit and all the different folks involved. I mean, it's incredibly complex. But at the end of the day, I'll call it a risk assessment. You know, someone has to decide, you know, how risky is that deal? Is that worth me getting involved in or not? And we've been looking at, you know, the folks who do those valuations. I mean, even like the Dun and Bradstreets and folks that are actually out there and trying to talk to them and seeing their interest in incorporating some of this thought process that I put out there. But and one of the conditions that, that partners with that is, is the capability of the regulator. So if you look at Saturn and UAE, you know, you want to look at is it independent? Is it independent? But, you know, that's sort of the first <coughs> principle from IEA, you know, that we want an independent regulator, and there have right. been comments about you know, what happened in Japan, and maybe they weren't as independent as they should have been, et cetera. But you start with that as a first principle, and then you get into, great that they're independent, but that they have a clue what they're doing. You know, do they have the knowledge of what they're regulating in order to be an effective regulator? And then on top of that, if they have knowledge and independence, will they actually do something when they see something wrong? So you look at it at all three levels, and have to diligence the regulator to be confident that they will be the adult in the room because the lenders are not gonna be able to monitor the project on a daily basis. And so they're gonna to wanna to look to that host country regulator to make sure that they are capable, which raises the question in terms of the build own operate model, the sort of Russian model of, hey, hire us, point to where you want it, we'll do everything. It does raise the question of who's minding the store and does the host country regulator have the capability, if they're going to Moscow and being trained, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but then will they act independently or be beholden to the country of origin for everything that they do? Yeah, no, great point. May I add something there? <coughs> sure. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, to add something uh, because the, the case of uh, Foner and the Emirates uh, is, uh, to my mind, again, unique. Uh, the Emirates are in the, uh, the nice situation of uh, having enough money to, uh, to, to buy whatever it is that they need, uh, and they bought a uh, very good regulatory scheme, not only modeled after the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, but they actually hired somebody out of the uh, NRC, somebody who I know quite well because he regulated me uh, for about 20 years and uh, did a very, very effective job. And he went around the world and got other good regulators from the UK and other places. So there is a, there is a, a very good cadre of people at Foner a, uh, as we speak right now. The trick over the long term is to transition to a situation in which the Emiratis are actually doing uh, most of the regulation themselves because these people are not going to be expatriates uh, there forever. But I don't know of any place else in the world except maybe Saudi Arabia where there's enough money to replicate this model, uh, nor do I think there's a willingness to do this uh, in most countries. And so that regulatory risk is, uh, is, a, is a very important factor uh, in uh, the, the, the risk profile for projects like this. If, if I could add one thing, uh, going back, tying this into uh, small modular reactors and so, is uh, I got the impression uh, in Abu Dhabi a few weeks ago that it's so complex, it's such a huge struggle, it's such a steep hill to climb to establish the regulatory uh, infrastructure and to build a nuclear reactor that it may be just easier thing to do to establish some sort of plug and play small modular reactor thing which sort of um, on a build on operate basis which makes it much easier for them to get to the point where they have uh, carbon free nuclear power. That's a very dangerous road to go down, but I can see that the obstacles to establishing an industry uh, are huge where it may be easier just to buy small plants and have them somehow um, outsource some of the other issues. Dangerous way to go, but I can see where there's a lot of uh, uh, institutional obstacles, regulatory obstacles that can effectively stall um, many nuclear uh, 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 ambitions of many countries. I think. Um <clears throat> raise a good point, but I don't think SMRs, there's still going to be a, a wide swath of regulatory activities that you would need. As a matter of fact, what the SMR guys in this country complain about is the fact that the regulation is just going to be t t 
too onerous. Um, you know, you're going to have to look at zones for contamination, all, all of those things. So I think the idea that you can plug and play, that sounds to me, again, like the notion that you have a reactor that you can walk away from after an accident. It's kind of the, the, the holy grail. Well, some of the smaller reactors, you can just come and take a trip, um, uh, um, a truck, and pull it away. <coughs> the thing that we have to realize is that we're not making a unique product. You know, uh, it's electricity. So there's many other ways of making electricity. So a lot of these countries who are financially challenged are going down the path of least resistance. So we see nuclear costs and regulatory costs climbing, and then we see solar energy costs declining. You know, so uh, who cares if we don't have electricity in the middle of the night? We do have some electricity. So uh, there's, there's margins cool. in, in, and opportunities in the area for some of these countries to say, you know, that uh, we can couple the solar with natural gas or so. So we're not, we don't, we don't have a monopoly on p p power generation. I think that the industry uh, should be aware that there are, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's threats to that. In this country, we've clo we're, we're, we're closing, uh, uh, five reactors, or, or will have closed five reactors by the end of 2014 because of low natural gas prices. So uh, that can happen elsewhere, and it could also forestall the development of, of, of new reactors. We need to be aware that we're just not, uh, that there are other technologies there. I'm, I'm sorry I have to uh, intervene on this because it's true that there are five, rea four reactors have been shut down and one more is scheduled uh, next year. Um, of those reactors, uh, only two of them were uh, for economic reasons, and the economic reasons, uh, in fact, uh, were uh, significantly more than uh, just the cost of natural gas. Uh, the subsidies, which are being uh, used extensively uh, for wind technology, are, have so unleveled the playing field that the cost of electricity is actually negative in many places in the United States and you can't run a baseload plant uh, uh, at, at when the price of electricity is negative without losing money. And so there's the combination of, of wind subsidies, uh, the low price uh, for natural gas, and then the uh, three of the reactors, uh, Crystal River and the two at San Onofre, uh, those are being shut down for technical failures, one with regard to the utility doing a bad job of opening up the containment with a costly repair that was uneconomical, and San Onofre bought two uh, defective uh, steam generators, which uh, could not be made to work right in the regulatory scheme we have right now, and the cost of replacing them was, was too large. So these, the, the, the three of those five had nothing to do with, with natural gas. Uh, I disagree <clears throat> uh, respectfully uh, in the fact that if the price of natural gas was double or triple what it is, the economics of repairing the reactor at Crystal River and the, the, and the San Onofre's would have changed. So if natural gas was mm -hmm. at 10 bucks as opposed to at 4 bucks, the economics penciled out that the reason that uh, Edison decided to close that is that there was no certainty as far as restarting those reactors. And we had cheap natural gas, so who cares? We'll go ahead and just shut the reactors down and go ahead and use cheap natural gas. It's going to significantly impact CO2 emissions in the state, and you're reducing um, portfolio diversity. And I don't agree with the decision. I really wish those reactors were sure. continuing to operate. But it's, it's, you know, the rules are the rules that exist in the country today. Unfortunately, we are seeing a lot of very good nuclear generating assets closed for surprising reasons. I think we have a question in the back. Okay. Other questions from the audience? Then let me um, <clears throat> follow up with Gretchen. So we were in Korea just around the time when the scandal was first starting to break. Um, and we didn't get a lot of, so these workshops that we had featured government, uh, some government officials, uh, academics, some industry representatives. We didn't get too much response on the corporate governance uh, part of it. What, they're, what the Koreans were very concerned about was this capacity issue. How were they really going to build a lot of reactors in the UAE when they were building at home? Do you think after, and these scandals have just grown and grown, um, <clears throat> do you think after, at, at this point, that the Korean um, vendors and subsuppliers would be more amenable to this kind of corporate governance approach? And if so, how do you get to them, really? Yeah, no, it's a, a great question. Um, 
I don't, you know, have a, because <clears throat> you always ask difficult questions, um, <laughs> a great answer for you. I mean, you'd hope so. I mean, what would be interesting <coughs> is to look at, you know, you guys have just been to the, you know, see the new reactor that they're building. I mean, just would love to know, has there been any shakeout? Has anybody kind of, as far as, you know, them building these reactors abroad going, you know, maybe we got to be really careful in looking at if there is any corners getting cut, and making sure that quality control is at you know its utmost. Um, I'd just be curious if there was any more stringent kind of look at and back to financing. You know, maybe the finance folks are looking at this and going, maybe this is a little riskier deal than we really initially thought we were getting ourselves into. Um, but I mean, they, they you know they they were okay receptive. I mean, I mentioned a couple of the comments I got on the on the work. Um, it wasn't a complete thud by any means, but I agree that the issue at the end of the day was really human capacity. I mean, having the bodies, and that whole issue we heard about training and trying to train all these new folks and the King. I think, don't ask me what it stands for, but I think remember that acronym. Anyway. You can't forget King, it's kind of a great name. But anyways, this place for training of the, the next generation um, of, uh, of all these workers. So anyway, it sounds like... We had two, two finger from Paul. Um, can I ask that these not be for attribution? Or I know we're on the record, but can, can I sort of... There's an unknown person in the back of the room okay. for our, our web. This is being webcast. Okay. okay. Um, then I'll, I'll, I'll have to be intentionally vague on a few points because um, we're financing the deal. Um, the scandal in Korea has had an exceedingly high priority both for the lenders and for ENEC. And it's something that, that when it happened, they took exceedingly seriously. And a lot of time has been spent understanding the issue in terms of what exactly is going on and how might it affect the project. I think that, and I don't know if it came up in the conference in the UAE a few weeks ago, um, but ENEC was a very aggressive in investigating the issue and putting procedures in place. I can't really say more than that, but from a lender perspective, that was a confidence building measure to see that the ultimate customer took it very seriously. It didn't just say, well, this is the supplier's problem, we don't care. They, I, and I think that goes back to the point of having a very capable owner organization, you know, that that can be an intelligent customer of the nuclear technology to basically drive the process. You know, the Koreans took it, uh, that made it a very big issue, but ENAC took it very seriously and drove the process as well, and the lenders did as well. So you had pressure from three points. I mean, I think from the Korean perspective, it's an issue of pride, you know, and, and making sure that, you know, for future projects that this doesn't get in the way of them being successful. You know, their reputation was called into question. I mean, the, rea the unfortunate reality is this happens on all projects, whether it's a nuclear project or not, and perhaps because it was a nuclear project, it was taken even more seriously. You know, because of the high standards in the nuclear industry, the margin for error is so much less so that if there's any blip on the radar, you're gonna jump all over it. Um, you would hope that these things don't happen, but they do, and you have to deal with them. So I think that, that being a responsible customer was important. It was important for the lenders to see. It was important to see that Fanner was taking it very, very seriously well. <coughs> and so I think when you talk about why should you behave well, why should you care about things as the seller, the fact that we see that the lenders and the regulator and the ultimate owner were all over this was a very big deal. One of the reasons why it is so important for, for entirely different reasons is the reference plant for the deal is Shinkori three and four. So for an APR of 1400, it's never been built before anywhere in the world. They're being built in Korea. And so one of the issues was, well, the APR 1400 would come online so many years in advance of BRCA1, of, the, of, of four. And so you would have multiple years of operating history and you know the, whether it's the commissioning, the testing, everything. And there was confidence in that you would have this number of years. Well, because of the cabling issue, it's gonna delay those projects in Korea by a certain amount of time and people can research what it is, let's just say it's significant. 
by having that delay, you are cutting into the amount of operating history you will have before the first unit comes online in BRCA. So for very selfish reasons, that's an issue too for the ultimate owner of these projects because now it's affecting some of the, the data that they would have had to, to layer into that project. So it's a big issue from many different areas, but I think you know the important thing is that it, it's not just the Koreans taking responsibility for their failures. It's important to see that the Korean government has jumped all over this, that the owner, the lenders, and the host country regulator are all over the issue. So it's not something that they could hide from even if they wanted to, but I think from the way they've responded and taken it very seriously, everybody's taken confidence that, yes, we've had a very unfortunate thing happen, but it's being handled in a very serious manner. Other questions from the audience in the back? Uh, good morning, Jim Malone from Lightbridge. Uh, I just want to amplify what the gentleman from the bank was saying, and uh, basically, uh, my training has always been that the, the operator of the plant is ultimately responsible for safety. It stops right there. And the feedback has to go from them, and uh, ENEC is a really good example of doing it right. And the, the thing that concerns me is where you have a situation like the build, own, operate, where the regulator, if there even is one, has kind of a paper tiger mentality, and the operator is the one that's really the designer, the builder, and the get out of my way guy. And I think that that's a, that's a difficult situation to uh, rectify with the operator being ultimately responsible in a country that may have a weak regulatory regime. So I, I just throw that out there to think about as a uh, kind of a caution where here in the US, I think with INPO, we have a really strong operator capability mentality about a strong nuclear safety culture. Uh, WANO, I hate to say it, but WANO is not as strong as INPO. And WANO needs some work, and, and what they deal with that makes their job so difficult is the diversity of cultures that their responsibility spans. So how do we help WANO, would be one question, to be able to be stronger and do the things that INPO can do to demand excellence? Can I respond to this? Great. Great question. Um, I was just going to men mention that at the break, someone came up to me and said, you know, why didn't you have WANO on your list of the company, of the organizations, the entities? And it's exactly for that reason. Um, I said, because I don't think they deserve to be. I mean, they just don't have the teeth that those other organizations are, are, are really trying to, and so I completely applaud your comment that what we can do to try to help WANO, but it, 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 it's, anyway, it's not there yet. What, what, what Jim has, uh, has mentioned, uh, I think, is, is very important as a general principle. We, our focus was on responsible suppliers, but you've got to have responsible customers as well. Uh, and it is uh, being a responsible customer is doing what ENEC did uh, at the advice of their o International Oversight Board to chase this one down and make sure that it doesn't uh, <coughs> impact their project. I'm not sure that every place in the world the same kind of response would uh, would occur from every customer. Right. So the, the slides, <laughs> how I got into this <laughs> was my concern about when, when you look at the distribution of nuclear energy, it's going to shift dramatically from countries that are mostly in the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, North America, um, to lesser developed countries. And so the question is, uh, you know, in my mind for a long time is, all right, if you have some issues about governance in those countries, what can you do? Well, clearly those countries themselves have to build up their capabilities, but, you know, what will the suppliers also need to do? I would argue that the UAE may be the anomaly. Uh, because they've had, uh, A, because it's the first country in the Middle East that's going to have nuclear power, so it has to be uh, b better than the best. B, because they have a lot of money to, you know, purchase the kinds of, of um, uh, expertise that they need. So, you know, the question is Bangladesh. I, I ran into a Bangladeshi nuclear official, ran into him. We were in Vietnam. And uh, I said, so really, 
why did you choose the Russians? Financing, cost. Um, and, you know, but there's a whole, it's, it's a package deal, right? And so the, the, the uh, safety culture, all of it, all of it will be Russian. The Bangladeshis will be sent to Russia to learn Russian. Uh, you know, so there are some issues um, with that. I'm not getting down on the Russians, but um, they are not, they are, have clearly, Bangladesh clearly has not developed the kind of uh, capacity that it, or capabilities that it needs in um, governance, whether you want to talk about nuclear safety, you know, security, regulation, all of those things to, you know, be able to, to be a strong regulator in this scenario. And so that's the kind of thing that we need to watch across the board and that the nuclear suppliers themselves have to be quite cognizant of uh, and not, you know, always just so ready to jump in with, uh, you know, sweeteners to these deals. Um, do my panelists have any last words of wisdom to offer? What time's lunch? <laughs> <laughs> well, we can certainly uh, no, no, we can certainly break early. Um, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for attending. We will have um, we'll, we'll have uh, Manpreet Sethi in January, who's uh, attended our Indian workshop uh, here to talk about uh, some nuclear issues. In January, uh, we'll also be issuing a broader report on the Sustainable Nuclear Futures Project um, <clears throat> after the holidays. But um, please join me in thanking our terrific speakers. Thank you. Thank you.